include some of that in our talk. So uh, let's uh, give uh, Professor Todd a warm welcome. So much, Terry and Steve and all the rest of the CCL folks who have been uh, close partners over these years, and I've, I've watched it grow and thrive, and it's just such an um, amazing thing as a climate scientist to see the momentum that we have today. Thank you so much, part to to y'all. And so I'm going to take a quick dive into the Pacific Ocean with my talk today, uh, which is going to center on my core research, and I want to shout out to all my amazing students at Georgia Tech that I've had over the years. Um, with uh, sustained funding from federal agencies, uh, NOAA and um, NSF in particular. And then we'll come back to Georgia. But first we're going to start at the biggest picture, which is global average temperatures uh, over the instrumental record, and it's getting warmer. <laughs> you know, this is what happens when you speak to the choir, and then we have a lot of knowing chuckles, which is so nice and so refreshing. <laughs> uh, and, and as we can see here, uh, these punctuations of record warming temperatures are always marked by El Nino events. And El Nino events are at warming for six to nine months, um, in the Central Pacific to Eastern Pacific Ocean. And the last one that we had in 2016 was the cause of the largest uh, uh, warming to 2015-2016 um, on record in global temperatures. So it reached a new high, which hopefully we won't break anytime soon, except we know we will. And El Nino is not just about warming of the ocean, it's a phenomenon that impacts the globe with respect to temperature and rainfall patterns and the occurrence and intensity of climate extremes. And so here's a map of the El Nino related impacts that cause drought and flooding uh, across many different areas with huge agricultural impacts and um, infrastructure impacts. And closer to home, La Nina events are equally damaging. This is the cooling phase of this climate phenomenon. And these, this is just a snapshot, of course, of the record break in 2017 hurricane season, where we saw three simultaneous hurricanes in the North Atlantic. Um, La Nina's drive um, uh, an increase in North Atlantic hurricane activities, which in part uh, drove uh, a portion of the intensity for that season. And so one of the most pressing questions in climate science boils down to this. Is this natural climate cycle, natural climate extreme getting stronger with climate change? And what does that mean for uh, human systems and ecosystems as we try to prepare for a warming world? And when we look at the instrumental record, we see El Nino's going up and down, and I marked some of the bigger ones here, but I want to note that this gets very, very fuzzy earlier in the record because we just don't have the record of temperatures that we do from these very remote regions going back before about 1950. We start to fall off some pretty important um, observational systems and declines in our data coverage. And so with this kind of data set, we just can't address that question. And I spent the better part of 20 years of my research career trying to address this with older records uh, from corals. And we go to the middle Pacific to collect these records. And so this was uh, the, the line island chain that spans from the equator up to six north. And it's uh, almost smack in the middle of the Pacific Ocean <laughs> geographically. And I've taken a, a lot of different <laughs> boats and planes of different kinds to get down to these very remote research sites, um, part American-owned and part Republic of Kiribati. The first of which was in 1997, down to Christmas Island. And this was during a massive El Nino event, which was at the time a record-breaking event. Of course, now we know it has been superseded by the 2016 El Nino event, but that's what these events look like when they uh, come in, uh, take over the ocean temperatures for a while, and they have a huge impact in this area. And this research cruise was transformational for me because, you know, this is the kind of vista that you get to see <laughs> at these uninhabited islands in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and I was definitely hooked, and I, I haven't really stopped uh, driving, driving uh, of my research program forward with these sites. And underwater, these sites are just as beautiful, and we've, uh, in this case, uh, you know, Donnie by Indiana Jones appearances and look alike, and uh, recovering the coral core from the middle of these uh, Pacific Oceans, from these reefs. And this is going to help us go back in time to reconstruct those <coughs> temperatures. And this is what we've been doing at Georgia Tech for, for a very long time. And so when we dive on the modern reef, we're looking at recovering records of tens of years. That's what the living reef affords us. 
And then if we want to go back further in time, we can go to the beaches where we have these um, older materials scattered around. And those can take us back 7,000 years, and we use radioactive dating <laughs> techniques to find out when they grew and do our reconstructions. And so back at Georgia Tech, we can cut these cores open and we can reveal these growth bands. You can see them here kind of going back in time, this case over the most recent past. And we basically use a uh, oxygen isotope proxy, which is the ratio of oxygen 18 to oxygen 16. I don't know how much you know, tolerance y'all have for that on Saturday morning. But um, at any rate, uh, this is a very accurate temperature proxy for the upper ocean temperatures in which the corals grew. And so when you apply this on a millimeter by millimeter scale down this core, we drill a pattern, we analyze that uh, geochemistry, we can reconstruct uh, month to month to month temperature changes that have occurred back through the history of these coral skeletons. And this becomes an ideal El Nino proxy to look at the natural variations of this climate cycle before the instrumental record. And how good can we do with this? It's actually amazing. These are uh, eight different coral records in colors over the recent past for which we have very good temperature data. The temperature data is in gray and the colors, again, are the corals. And you can see that the corals are doing an incredible job tracking the ups and downs of ocean temperatures at this very remote site. And of course, this is an interval for which we have pretty good temperature data, so you know, we, we don't, these squirrels aren't telling us anything new here, but obviously when we get coral records that go back 100 or, or even 1,000 or several thousand years, we're getting this first ever glimpse at some of these uh, ancient El Nino events and how they compare to those whoppers that we're seeing today in the latter part of the 20th century and coming forward. When we look at the context of the 2016 El Nino event, which is right there um, at, at a minus 5.5 off my mass spec, which doesn't mean much to you, uh, but this is a scale where warmer is up and cooler is down. And when we look back at the pieces of, of corals that I've been able to pull together from Christmas Island, so we have 1,000 AD here up to 2,000 in, in 2016 on the very far right, you can see how unusual that 2015-2016 event is in the context of the last millennium, obviously missing a lot of data here, and that's what the, what the point of my work is, to amass more and more. And I'm not going to really belabor that today because I want to come back to Georgia, but uh, we can deal with it in questions if you're interested, but you can extend this record all the way back to 6,000 years ago, and when we do the statistics on El Nino strengths across this very long pre-industrial baseline, we find that the package of El Nino events that have occurred over the last 50 years is significantly stronger than those that occurred over the entirety of the pre-industrial baseline that we collected from our site. And so this is um, under review right now by my graduate student, and so fingers crossed that it goes forward. And it really is part of a body of work coming forward from the paleoclimate literature, strongly suggesting that this climate cycle, like many other climate cycles that we know, um, is becoming more intense with greenhouse gases. And that has really important implications. We're going to talk about one of those implications today because the most recent El Nino event really uh, took my research site for quite the ride in terms of extended and prolonged ocean temperature warming. And so this is a map of the ocean temperatures uh, during November 2015, the peak of the last El Nino event. And this is me before that El Nino event on the reef. Um, this is a beautiful, diverse, almost 100% cover coral diversity, uh, coral biodiversity, uh, really high indices here. And I'm installing a temperature sensor ahead of what we knew then would be a very, very large El Nino event. So as a scientist, I was very excited. I was going to be strapped into this science ride and observe this event that I've been chasing in my records for two decades at that point. And so I'm going to show you a series of pictures that speak to the level of bleaching stress that this site saw. And here it is in numbers in graph form. So here is the start of the El Nino event in spring of 2015. Ocean temperatures rose to bleaching levels within several months. So here's the NOAA coral bleaching alerts peaking to alert level two. I'm um, staying that way for 10 or 12 months before they came back down. And so these are unprecedented levels of coral bleaching stress at this site. And you really, I was telling Noah, y'all you know, need like alert level three and four because you just saturate this um, for so long, it really doesn't help the public understand the severity of the impact at that point. So that's a, a basically a 100% um, bleaching um, 
level expected. And that's exactly what we saw when we went back in November 2015 and we did the surveys. It's the same site that I showed you before, but now you're seeing the ocean temperatures have driven a massive coral bleaching event where the corals release their photo, their colorful photo symbionts uh, that are embedded in their tissues and make them food. And all of these pale colors, uh, corals, are in the process of starving because they don't have about 50% of their food sources that these photosynthetic biology normally bring to them. The bleaching levels that we observed per site varied, so some were closer to 30%, this one was closer to 90% bleaching. And some species were already completely wiped off the island. Some species were already completely 100% dead by November 2015. And we still had six months of elevated ocean temperatures to get through when we took a picture like this. And so we went back in April 2016, and our worst fears had come true. Uh, up to 85, 90% of the reef had died. So those bleaching had given way to coral mortality at these sites and virtually no species escaped intact. There were a couple remnant, um, you can see a kind of a live one here hanging on for dear life um, in the middle of this coral, otherwise coral graveyard. So what you see are this uh, kind of brown, red algae kind of wafting on top of the surface corals that have been killed over the last several months at this site. So this was really a, a devastating event to have to witness and it landed me on the front page of the New York Times in kind of a grim moment on uh, April 9th, uh, 2016, as really one of the first eyewitness accounts to what would become a global scale coral bleaching and mortality event. Of course, we heard about the Great Barrier Reef in, in the next months, uh, the North Atlantic, Florida, Hawaii, the reports coming in from the Indian Ocean about the devastations um, that were witnessed during that year. And so I want to fast forward to something more, much closer to home. This was an ocean temperature event that caused heat stress and mortality to corals, which was a huge wake-up call for me and a major pivot um, in my uh, research career and uh, personal life, as I'll share in a minute. But much closer to home, we have been breaking temperature records across the globe, and these, there's a daily high, a new daily high achieved in Death Valley last July. And she looks a little bit uh, mixed as to her feelings about that. And he seems perfectly happy to be standing next to that uh, temperature record level. And I showed this picture to my husband. He's like, you know, we are, we're really, he's a climate scientist. We're really, this is really just, you know, like a sci-fi movie for climate scientists that we're kind of witnessing in real time here. And some of those temperatures, uh, record-breaking temperatures across the world during summer of 2018. Um, the Scripps Pier, where I did my graduate career, um, recorded four individual daily average record highs in a row um, in summer of 2018. So it was, a, it, was a, it was a bad year from that perspective. It was a bad year from wildfires' perspective. Um, this is, of course, a picture from California during the devastating wildfire season, uh, broke all kinds of records in terms of the damages, the uh, catastrophic lo loss of life, the aerial extent of the burn. And we can see here that the level of burn, uh, of course, in, in terms of aggregate area burn in California um, is uh, in lockstep with the spring and summer temperatures that are achieved uh, to set the course of the wildfire um, season because of the uh, drying out of soil layers, the drying out of vegetation that primes the uh, western United States for uh, a volatile uh, reaction to sparks and other kinds of incidents that uh, can, can drive these fires and set them off and then it's very hard to control them. So a lot of work now pointing to a clear climate link in wildfires. Much closer to home here in the southeast, <clears throat> southeastern U.S. These are, um, well, Hurricane Lee, not southeastern U.S. That was Hawaii, of course, but this was a devastating um, set of records that were breaking in the last couple of years with uh, tropical storm events. And so, you know, the last one, Hurricane Florence here, dropped a record-breaking 8 trillion gallons of rainfall over the course of its path through North Carolina, South Carolina, um, by far a record. And so these are all statistics pulled from the National Weather Service, statistics that I hope we will not break in coming years, but unfortunately, we know we will. Um, these are the kinds of events that are going to determine um, the, the, the pace of, of resilience and the, the pace of devastation in the southeastern U.S., unfortunately, in a climate-changing world. 
This is a graph that Noah pulled together for the billion dollar time series. So this is the, uh, you get to be on this graph if you cost a billion dollars or more of climate damage. <laughs> so it's really not a good club to be in. Uh, but you can see here the types of uh, billion dollar disasters are not just wildfires, not just storms, um, but we have uh, winter storms, uh, flood events, uh, inland flooding event, of course, we're just witnessing now in the mid Midwestern US. Uh, is going to be another billions of dollars of damage type event to add onto this bar graph. And you can see this is a, a becoming a pretty steady trend. The biggest addition here through time is that severe storm category. Okay, and that's, that's something that we are going to be seeing more of. Um, we, we see it already in some of these data sets, how crippling these events are. I wanted to speak to the aggregate impact of climate change on the southeastern U.S. Um, this is a uh, compilation that's put forward by the Brookings Institution. I, I highly recommend it as a kind of accessible read for some of the ways that climate change is going to affect the southeastern U.S. And this is an aggregate uh, look at the county by county income losses where reds are in the 10 to 30 percent income loss categories for much of the southeastern United States. So we are really in the bullseye of climate change impacts going forward. And you can look at what's causing those income losses and you can kind of drill down and look at what is causing those and you're going to see things like agricultural losses, heat wave, uh, heat stress causing mortality in these many of these counties where uh, folks don't have access to adequate air conditioning because of the energy burdens and energy costs um, for um, in many underserved communities. So drilling down into some of that, um, here is the uh, agricultural losses and the pinks and reds uh, projected with climate change. And there's the one that really centers the southeastern U.S., the mortality statistics for heat-related stress and mortality in the southeastern U.S. will be very, very high, and uniquely so, right? And so this has a direct economic hit. We talk about um, uh, high-risk labor pools um, really being hardest hit, and those industries that are associated with those, construction, um, all of the outdoor industries, um, these are going to be, and that's of course agriculture as well in many cases, taking big hits as the heat exposure ramps up, and uh, you just can't, you'll be not able to work on certain days, first of all, from an economic perspective, but from a um, kind of an equity perspective, again, the fact that we have such high energy burdens here in the, in the southeastern U.S., uh, where people are not going to have access to adequate uh, cooling, that's really a, um, a straight mortality of people who are, are vulnerable to heat. So we're talking about um, the elderly and the young people, anybody with the immunocompromised, et cetera. And this is where that statistics really gets pretty sobering on the um, projected rise of warmth at night. And so with the national climate, this is from the national, for the national climate assessment, sorry, the link is not appearing here, but um, this is from the recent 2018 national climate assessment. And they really pulled some uh, health statistics uh, folks in to illustrate uh, what the projected trends are in, in nighttime temperatures because it's the nighttime temperatures that are driving that mortality, that heat-related mortality, because folks can't cool down from the temperatures during the day and they can't rest at night. And so they get themselves into spirals of compromised health and they get closer and closer to uh, heat stroke and heat exhaustion. Um, and it can be a slow enough creep that it doesn't look like an acute emergency uh, but those are the kinds of things that we're going to have to get ahead of when we think about this. And I wanted to note an interesting phenomenon, which is you can see all the cities on this graph, right? Um, and that's, that's where we have to think about how we can get ahead of these impacts with urban planning um, and resource allocation so that we don't fall prey to these urban heat islands being a huge pylon for vulnerable communities in the southeastern U.S. So this is something I'll come back to in a minute. But that's, I think, an interesting feature of these plots. Okay, so I wanted to speak briefly about the coast because coastal impacts, of course, are some of the things we think of most often when we think about climate change impacts, but they're geographically confined. These maps are, are much more extensive than just the coast. But here in Georgia and across much of the southeastern U.S., we have these vulnerable coastlines. 
And I wanted to draw attention in particular to Savannah, where I, I just spent uh, much of this week looking at um, sea level rise solutions. And this is a map that the Chatham County Emergency Management Agency put together for the vulnerability to different storm surges across our coast. And basically, you can see the entire county is basically knocked out by um, some of these uh, higher levels category of uh, storm surge events. And these are, um, if, you know, something that could bring one foot to 18 feet of storm surge to this area. And sea level rise is, of course, marching forward. So I call this the most boring graph in all of climate science because, honestly, <laughs> I mean, we could look at temperature looks a lot more complicated. Precipitation, hurricanes look a lot more complicated. This looks pretty boring. Um, and it's true, it's just going upwards. And the big, big questions are, um, how fast will it accelerate? And what can we do to get in front of this from an impacts perspective? This is a plot, again, from Chatham County Emergency Management showing the incidence of flood rates where those purples are major flood events. And this is a statistic that went into their most recent report. 60% of major flood events in the history of this uh, record uh, occurred since 2015. And now it's not just storm surges. Now it's blue sky flooding. This is a picture taken over Thanksgiving weekend in Savannah um, at the, one of my friend's neighbor's houses. And this is blue sky and winds have started to pile up the ocean on this person's lawn. Okay, so this is happening every single month with a high tide and some wind events. Okay, coming back to solutions now, because I know y'all are very depressed. <laughs> so, you know, we're not going to just leave it there. I'm not that kind of climate scientist. I'm not going to do that to you. Um, but one last bit of, of somewhat depression is that, you know, we have a lot of work to do to keep global temperatures to internationally recommended targets. The 1.5 degrees C report is an amazingly accessible document if you haven't read it, um, but we would need to aggressively and urgently reduce emissions. And they outline a number of strategies. Um, this is the one that y'all are really gunning towards with the CCL legislation trying to decarbonize grid, decarbonize transportation. But we also need, they stress, to increase the uptake of carbon dioxide into natural sinks, because it's not going to be enough to decarbonize the grid, to decarbonize transportation. It won't be fast enough. That's the bottom line. And this piece too. We need to meet the decarbonization of the grid and the transportation and the sinks of CO2 with massive social and cultural change so we can reduce demand, the demand side. We have got to stop using so much energy, full stop. It just isn't going to be enough. And I think this report really lays it out super, super clear. And of course, all of this is planning for a climate future that is not a future anymore, it's a climate now. We need to adapt to the climate changes that we have today. All of this demands novel solutions. It demands a scale of effort that we have really never witnessed as a world. So uh, how can we contribute? What can I do? What can we do? And as I like to point out, what can all these other organizations that we are part of do? at the mid-scale. So we, also, we often talk about the personal climate action versus the collective climate action like CCL is advocating for in DC. There's all these scales that are going to have to rise the challenge as well. It's not enough that I ride my bike, although I did my bike here and it was amazing. Um, yeah. Bikers. <laughs> it's not enough to have national legislation. We're going to need to tackle every single scale in between. And so that's the message I want to give to the choir today. All right, that, that's the main message. Thanks to you for all that you are doing, but we need to do more. First, talk about it all the time. I talk about it all the time, it's very annoying, but I still <laughs> talk about it all the time. Um, uh, reduce your own carbon footprint. Um, be, a, be that social contagion. Go there with your body and your family and your choices. And when you talk about that, you can be that hub of social contagions. Help your institutions move down here, and then help, help elect leaders who are going to advance um, bills like a carbon fee, a dividend, and other um, measures to help us adapt to our climate now. This is my uh, Corals and Cave account. If you want to hear more about how all this rolls out through time and keep up with me my crazy existence, <laughs> you can. Um, I have a great time on social media. Um, as, it, as again, I started biking to work in 2017, and it has changed my life. Um, I am now that crazy biker girl. 
really. Um, and I get these amazing co-benefits. I, I get you know workouts. I get reminded that I care every single day, at least twice a day. Um, and I'm also involved in biking, bike, advancing bike infrastructure. And I have like this bike family, right? This is about my bike family out there. I'm new there. <laughs> Uh, here's some of the other things I did since 2017 uh, that have meant a lot to me. I started picking up trash, like, that's like social taboo. Who does that, right? Uh, I do that. Thank, thank you. Th thank you. And thank you. Then thank you. So, and you. Uh, so, you know, am I saving any carbon? No, but um, I'm reminding myself on a daily basis that I do care, and the ways that we have learned to ignore things around us, the level of cognitive dissonance I have, energy I have to spend to walk by that trash was no longer worth it to me. So this is just part of the process. Um, I'm, I'm drying my clothes when I'm not entirely lazy. I'm not saving that much carbon, but uh, my kids are watching me doing it, right? They're like, geez, mom. Um, and some of my other neighbors are like, geez, Kim. And, and uh, <laughs> I bought solar panels for my house and a, and a big battery, and that uh, switch goes live this week, and I'm so excited by that. Um, we're solarized Atlanta. Atlanta's been a huge leader in this. Um, a fair amount of carbon, but not the biggest piece on the list. Um, the biggest piece on the list is the flying less piece. So um, as a upper middle class American, you know, I'm flying maybe 100, 125,000 miles a year. Um, that's like a couple of national trips and like a handful of domestics. And, and many of us do that, right? Many of us, that's our normal way of doing life. It's like the trash thing though. The level of cognitive dissonance we have to maintain to keep that up in the face of the climate crisis, I hope is sobering for, for many of us. It became too much for me to bear. And so I started uh, flying about 75%, 80% less, even as a engaged academic. I get a lot of heat for this one, so that's why the TBD, because like, I get the rotten tomatoes from my colleagues, <laughs> I get puzzled looks from members of the audience, like, did she really go there? Um, so that's, that's tough. The last one, planting trees, is super important. Um, so I plant the trees of Lana, trees of Lana, the trees, I got the trees, the tree family, okay, gotta love it. Um, I love planting trees of Lana, I go out about every other weekend, I take my kids with me, it's part of our lives. And I've planted about 20 plus trees personally um, over the last six to eight months. And so that's 20,000 pounds of carbon dioxide. It's 1,000 pounds per hardwood tree in the southeastern US. So if I keep up that pace, right, that's a huge amount of carbon on this slide. Engagement points plus, 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 right? I'm community building, I'm, I'm sucking carbon out of the sky, and I'm offsetting an urban heat island, which I'll talk about in a minute. I also offset all of my uh, flights with carbon uh, with Trees Atlanta. So you can uh, pay, they don't really take your money and call it a carbon offset, uh, but this is putting, pouring our money back in our communities uh, to serve these co-benefits uh, for um, all of us, right, for everybody. And so you can design your own carbon pricing scheme. Mine is pretty aggressive, I'm gonna tell you. It's about $200 a ton. <laughs> so I don't know if, if the bill and uh, pending in Congress is quite that aggressive, uh, Steve, but um, something to consider. Just kidding. <laughs> uh, this, this is a great study just came out in PNAS. Um, and this is a bike rider. I love like the bike carbon climate nexus. So she has a thermometer on her bike and she's mapping heat um, across her town, and she's seeing hot spots approaching 31 degrees Celsius, which is really hot, and then cool spots at 27 degrees. That's a four degree C differential across 10 city blocks. The only difference is tree cover. And so this is kind of illustrating for us um, how important it is to have a tree canopy uh, mitigating some of these urban heat islands. And it's actually a climate mitigation strategy. So. Uh, it's mitigating and um, why, why is it mitigating? Because people don't have to turn on air conditioners high in summer when we have uh, reduced demand for cooling. We can mitigate these urban heat islands. It's adapting because it's helping communities uh, save themselves from these acute temperature stresses. So when we have the urban jungles um, through, through underserved communities, we are piling on their acute energy burdens and their lack of access to adequate cooling with these um, unfortunate, um, unfortunate urban heat islands. And that's the stress on stress on stress that is going to kill people um, going forward with climate change. So that's how important trees are, that's how important urban planning is, that's how you can play a role in our city to help mitigate these problems. 
I want to mention the Global Change Program, which is a new program at Georgia Tech that I direct, which is why I'm like ultra super busy right now. Um, but I, I can't leave this off the plate because it's designed to help students equip and empower them to be part of the climate solution. I'm going to give you one example today of the kinds of programs that we're trying to do in this space. Um, and then at the same time, through our research, we're trying to put our foot on the pedal of those projects that can accelerate capacity here in Georgia um, for climate solutions from a research perspective. And then involve students wherever we can. Carbon reduction challenge is something I'm very passionate about. I always talk about it. This is, I started this in 2007 before I thought that there was a climate crisis and I had to devote the rest of my life to fixing it. Um, so it's grown a lot since 20, uh, 2007. This is a y-axis of uh, CO2 that will never be emitted because of student projects in the carbon reduction challenge. And so this is a scale that goes to 12 million pounds of carbon dioxide, working with partners on energy efficiency projects at scale. So they're moving needles at institutions like universities, elementary schools, hospitals, corporate headquarters, um, they're finding some big knobs and they're tweaking them very slowly. They're saving their partners money and they're getting on the job training to be climate heroes that we need them to be. Woo! Thank you. <laughs> so many people don't know what Kelvin and Pounds are. Maybe, maybe a lot of you do, I would imagine. But um, this is how I help folks visualize the importance of what students can do over one short summer. Um, avoiding the emissions associated with 34 homes that would be fully solar powered for 20 years straight. That's how much 12 million pounds of CO2 is. And 30 students are achieving that in one summer in this program at Georgia Tech. So if that doesn't tell you the, the power of scaling the individual up to a scale that's this mid-scale, I don't know what will, right? This is the kind of thing that's gonna have to happen if we're gonna collect actions at the ground level and have them meet a policy like a carbon fee and dividend at the large scale. This is the gap we need to close. Okay, I'm pretty, I'm pretty much done here. Just to note a big talking point about my sea level sensor project down on the coast. Um, this is uh, run under the umbrella of the Georgia Tech in partnership with Chatham County and um, City of Savannah. And we have these awesome, cool internet-enabled sensors on the coast in this network that is going to be 50 strong in a couple months. And here are these Georgia Tech design sensors, they're ultrasonic uh, technology based, and they're the internet of things, and they feed back in real time information about water levels at the hyper local level that enable emergency planners and responders to understand what's going down in a flood event, whether it's a blue sky, high tide event, or of course, um, the inevitable uh, storm that we expect them to face. And last but not least, I wanted to point y'all to this amazing, relatively new resource in the state of Georgia uh, called the Georgia Climate Project, which is a consortium of uh, universities, Emory, Georgia Tech, and UGA are the founding partners, but now it's including Georgia State. I think Agnes Scott is a member of the consortium um, and growing by the day across the state. And so this also is a way for students to get involved with climate solutions. It's a way to draw professors into larger projects than they would be able to mount by themselves. And it's exciting because it aims to really engage in a bipartisan framework policymakers and decision makers across the state to help them understand what climate impacts me and what we can do about them, both on adaptation side to adapt to the climate threats and the mitigation side how to get involved in, in Georgia understanding the, the importance of being in that game. And I'd like to end with a slide of my four kids because they remind me that I have to wake up every day and do my best and then know that that's not enough and do more. So big uh, thank you recognition to them as, as driving forces for much of what I do. And I know that many of you share that sentiment as well. Thank you so much.